So, having said all that, Barney, who are you? Are there any medical students in the room? Kind of a lot. All fourth year medical student types? Not any medicine you. residents? Wow. Okay, a handful. Nice. Pediatric residents. Educational support. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's all good. We're all friends with the pediatricians. I'm not a pediatrician, but I like those guys. Who else do we have? Advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners, physicians associates, etc. Okay, good. And other so-called allied health people, not trained in medicine or nursing, but business, administration, global health general. Okay, here's the ground rules. Let me start this with the last time. Oh, and it crashed. See, as soon as he left, it did that. Let's try again. I'm going to start this, and the deal is that my style is that you guys interrupt me if I say something you don't understand. There is nothing worse than somebody blathering on and you can't understand what the heck they're talking about. These comments definitely were developed with medical doctors and advanced practice practitioners in mind. Um, but having said so, you ask me anything, okay? So we're starting, and by the way, we're going to cover everything today, right? I've got parasites for you. We've got single cell parasites, we've got some worms, bacteria, viruses. What are we not doing? Maybe a little fungus later? Um, so I, this is very much open. It's sort of a hodgepodge of different things. I hope that's okay. So the concept is that we start with the trypanosomes. Trypanosomes and leishmaniasis. And the goal is that by the end of this, if you know all about trypanosomiasis, I teach you maybe one or two new things. If you don't know what the heck these things are right now, you'll be really savvy by the end of the hour. And it's very much clinically focused. I spent years researching these guys. That's not what we're talking about, just clinical issues. Please keep it interactive. And I meant to say this goes throughout the entire day. There's no conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest. That's the whole problem with global health. There's no money. So yeah, I'm not in anybody's pocket. So Manson, uh, Sir Patrick Manson's the, if there's any one person who kind of invented Prop Med, of all the DWMs, the dead white men, I mean, he's one of the big ones, right? He said back in the 1800s, the helmet and the protozoan as regards tropical pathology are in the ascendant. There's more and more parasites all the time. He said it more than 100 years ago. It is as true today as ever. If I'm not mistaken, you spent the morning looking at stool, right? Talking about worms coming out of people's butts and such. So you know what I'm talking about. This is the real deal. Let's give you a different example. So three different cases. Case number one, a laborer from the Congo, and this is him. This is not my case. It's a case from the WHO TDR. But evidently, he is uh, emblematic of many people in the same situation. He's a young man, previously healthy, who then starts to go crazy. Gradual cognitive decline, delirium, agitation. Sometimes in the daytime, he's very sleepy. At nighttime, he's agitated and difficult to control. Ultimately, he goes into a coma and dies. And in the photograph, you can see that he is bound with a rope by his hands and his feet to the roots of the tree. He was tied to the tree by his family because they cannot control him. And they are terrified that he will run into traffic and be hit by a, a truck and killed. Case number two, a 56-year-old British uh, citizen living in Brazil for many years. And he wrote in his diary, in the way only the British can. The smallest exertion is the most irksome. Periodic vomiting. I was almost quite broken down. My head was swimming, my hands trembling, and never a week without violent vomiting. Very weak, only able to tolerate short walks. Headaches, fatigue, depressed, flatulent, prolonged spells of daily vomiting, acid and slime, this sinking sensation and shiver. Now, he died of this condition and congestive heart failure of both the left and the right side. In the last case, we'll start with also from Brazil, a younger man who's a laborer, and this is him. It didn't start off this way, of course. It started off with a problem in the back of the nose, perhaps even the soft palate or the tonsils. And over a matter of months, in fact, greater than a year, he has noticed these erosions of the nasal septum, which is gone. He's lost his entire upper lip. And if you look into the mouth, you would see that his soft palate has been replaced with a granulomatous tumor. He no longer is able to speak effectively, and in fact, his airway is jeopardized by this. Without treatment, he will die. So that's where we are. We can come back to each of these cases to illustrate each of the infections we talk about. So I am not a microbiologist, although we're teaching microbiology. 
I'm an infectious disease doctor, right? So the microbiologists like to talk about taxonomy and the organization of germs. I just want to know how to kill them and prevent them. So my view of life on planet Earth is this. The world's divided into prokes and eukes. So my whole career is actually prokaryotes, right? That's bacteria. But, and we're not talking about those, but among the eukaryotes, right, there's plants and fungi and animals. Plants never infected anybody, in spite of what patients will tell you. They don't have wood coming out of their Morgellons lesions. Fungi are interesting. We don't have time to talk about them. So what about the animals? I split them into two groups. There's the animals with more than one cell and the animals that have one cell. So among the ones that have more than one cell, truthfully, these are the helmets or the worms. And we divide them up by their shape. Are they round, they look like a tape, or are they sort of flat? And among the single-celled organisms, I like to divide them up by how they get around. What's their mobility? Do they um, move around um, by going through your gut, into your tissue, or into your blood? Where are they in the body? So for the moment, right now, we're talking about these tissue bugs. You're welcome to refer back to this general, very simple rubric. The problem with courses like this is that if we show you you know, sort of this museum of oddities, it's hard to figure out where they belong together. So I like having a simple organizational rubric, if you will. So the tissue bugs are the canidoplastidae, or the canidoplastids. And the canidoplastids all look the same. They're one cell, they have a nucleus, and they have a canidoplast. What is a canidoplast? The canidoplast is probably a rudimentary chloroplast that goes way back when, when one animal ate a plant, and instead of digesting it, they started living together symbiotically. In the case of the ketoplast, that chloroplast is essentially the engine, like a mitochondrion, that drives the activity of that beautiful membrane, this ruffled membrane that grows up from the back and goes up towards the front. In fact, coalesces together into a big old flagellum. It looks kind of like a sperm, right? Except instead of pushing itself, it pulls itself along through the street. There are three broad flavors of human importance in the trypanosomes, the leishmania, Trypanosoma brucei and Trypanosoma cruzi. So before lunch, we can do it. We're going to go through all three of these. Dude, that's a lot of work. It usually takes weeks to go through all this stuff. I'm going to do this with you in about an hour. So by the end, you're at least having a rudimentary sense of what we're talking about. And you can ask me questions at the break. So we'll start with T. brucei as the first. With respect to T. brucei, like with all of these microorganisms, the nomenclature, the words that you see when you read about these in the textbooks, they're highly confusing because you'll see all these odd terms. Does it, a, does it have a kinetoplast? Does it have an undulating membrane? What about all these different flavors, an amastigote versus an epimastigote? Do not be confused. They're all kinetoplastids, and during its life cycle, they'll take different shapes. And we describe them today, just like we did in the 1800s, what do they look like under a microscope? So if they have, for example, um, an epimastigote, meaning the mass that starts in front of the nucleus, that's sort of the uh, insect form of some of these germs. If it has no mast, no flagellum at all, that's called an amastigote. We see that a lot with respect to leishmaniasis. So don't be bogged down in these terms, please. They're all part of the same basic three groups. So let's talk about them one by one. Here's our labor. What's this gentleman got? None of you have seen a case, right? I've never seen a case of this. It's rare. And unless you work in certain parts of Africa, you won't encounter this infection. So it's an exotic thing, right? But it's important. This is sleeping sickness. The technical term is HAT, human African trypanosomiasis. And human African trypanosomiasis uh, is caused by trypanosoma brucei. The way we understand this particular infection is interesting. It actually goes way back when, going back over hundreds of years to that so-called golden age of microbiology when people would go to the jungle and look at a corpse, look inside and see what was there and get a disease named after them. That was sort of the model for medical microbiology. The bottom line here is that this is actually a very ancient condition, and we think that this goes back, in fact, for many centuries, although we don't have pathophysiologic evidence to prove that it's true. The bottom line here is that cases of sleeping sickness are caused by T. brucei, and there are two sub-flavors of T. brucei, okay? One is called subspecies Gambiense, or West African disease. Think of the Gambia in West Africa. And one is Rhodesiense, East African disease. Think of the old name for Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. Now, there's also an animal form of this called T. brucei brucei, which doesn't infect people, but it causes a terrible wasting sickness of cows. So for agricultural and developmental reasons, national level, important, not important from a clinical medical perspective. 
Is it a big problem? What is the epidemiology of this? Here's a picture of a patient who expired of sleeping sickness. It looks like a cadaver that's been lying in the sun for weeks. This is someone who just passed away. Again, to emphasize the terrible suffering that goes through uh, every one of these patients who gets this illness. We don't know. Have you noticed this in this course so far? If you haven't already, I'll be the first to tell you. We don't know how much of this is out there because the epidemiologic metrics are very, very imperfect. The people who are getting the infections don't have the benefit of public health to study, much less prevent these infections. But we do know something about uh, the history and the epidemiology of T. brucei. And we think based in particular on the work of MSF, that's Anne Sans Frontier, who are by far the most knowledgeable and skilled physicians around this, that there are probably tens of thousands of cases. And although we've said for years that about 100,000 people will die in a given year, that's actually a rough guess. My sense is that the number is smaller, and it's probably on the neighborhood of 30 to 40,000 who are dying. Still intolerable, but compared to HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, a much, much smaller issue. However, it's poised to get worse, right? And as is so true for so many conditions you'll study here, this is an infection that really takes advantage of civil unrest, a lack of infrastructure, and the migration, uncontrolled migration across borders, or even within a given national border. For example, here's an uh, epidemogram of the deaths due to HAT going back to the beginning of the last century and up uh, to just about 10 years ago. It's so intriguing. It looks, we think, like in the late 1960s, we were really, really close, really close to getting rid of this infection. And of course, the numbers have taken off. I think what happened back then was we were going after a totally different disease, but that shares the same turf, right? Malaria. We were nuking the world with DDT and getting rid of all the biting insects we could get our hands on. The vector of this infection fell uh, victim to that particular uh, DDT strategy, which was great. The problem is that you have to sustain this. The flies become resistant. And as people get in trouble with civil war, etc., these sorts of efforts absolutely uh, are become ineffective. The price of success has to be sustainability and vigilance, right? Having said so, in 2009, the WHO had fewer than 10,000 cases reported. Remember, in general, the WHO reports a case number. I don't know what you guys think. I usually say that's about one-tenth of what's probably actually there. Nobody reports anything to WHO. Ah, in sleeping sickness, they do. It's because it's all done by MSF, and MSF is very, very organized in what they do. They want to advocate for these patients, and so they really do forward all of their case series on to WHO. It's probably a reasonably accurate number, would be my guess. So where does this happen? This is a problem of Africa, as the name implies. We haven't found it outside the African continent. And as I mentioned, we have both a so-called East and so-called West African version. I'm showing you this slide simply to emphasize that that's a bad terminology. There's plenty of so-called West disease that happens East of the so-called East disease. With only one exception, you won't have any given country that has both flavors of the infection together. Uganda is the exception because there are so many people fleeing the devastation of Congo that they're bringing uh, West and East African disease together in Uganda. So far, we haven't had those two infections together in the same individual person or the same fly, but my sense is that it is likely only a matter of time. If you want to understand how you need to be savvy about Congo, this is by far the epicenter of the problem in Africa. Not only because it's so populous and so remote, but because it's so difficult to do public health work there because of the civil war, etc. There are parts of Congo where this is the leading cause of death, which is hard to resolve in my conscience, but evidently this is true. So here's how you catch sleeping sickness. That's larger than life size, but it is a fly. A biting fly called the tsetse fly. The tsetse fly apparently gets its name because of the sound it makes. Who's been bitten by a tsetse? It's usually one or two. So how do you know you were bitten by a tsetse? It hurts. It hurts like hell. I'll speak for him. He's a tough guy. It really hurts. These are horse flies, basically, right? So it's not like a mosquito, which are stealth feeders, and they use that proboscis to actually find the capillary and suck out as you sleep. These guys are pool feeders. They take a bite out of you and they just take a little bit of the blood that seeps into the wound after they take a chunk of flesh. And when they do so, they may also inadvertently inoculate you with the infection that they have. Now, the truth is, there's plenty of biting flies in Africa. You'll know it's a tsetse if you catch it and look at the wing. So if it has this so-called hatchet cell, it looks kind of like a meat cleaver there, doesn't it, or a little ax? That's pathognomonic. 
for the seats you fly. This shows up on tropical medicine exams from time to memorial. I don't see how that helps you as a clinician because no one's ever caught their fly. I wouldn't recommend that you try. But anyway, this is, if somebody actually brings a fly to you, this is what bit me, you could actually look at the wing and either reassure them or get a little bit nervous. So that's, that's what happens. You're bitten by a fly. Out of the saliva of the fly, into that pool where the bite has happened, come some of the infective forms of these single-celled trypanosomes. They enter the bloodstream, and that's where they live. They are in your system. They're perfectly happy to be inside Homo sapiens, and they reproduce by dividing. They are almost like bacteria. They're single-celled. They don't need romance. There's no candlelight dinner. They don't have to find somebody of the opposite sex. There is no sex. They just divide and divide and divide by binary fission until eventually, ultimately, another fly comes along, takes a bite, and the life cycle is perpetuated. Now, they do develop within the fly. They have to have the fly in order for them to be transmitted in nature. The truth is, if you got a, God forbid, a blood transfusion from this patient, you could get what we call mechanical transfer, but that's not how this usually happens in nature. I'd emphasize the disease that this produces is caused by these germs that live extracellularly. They don't have to get into your T lymphocyte, they don't love your macrophages, just they're dividing and ultimately they cause an encephalitis that we'll talk about presently. So it's a little confusing because trypanosomiasis is both an anthropognosis and a zoonosis. So anthropognosis is an infection of humans, zoonosis an infections that humans will share with other vertebrate hosts. So here's an example. When you think about T. gambiense, so-called West African disease, I want you to think about women doing the work of the world, which they do, going to the water, fetching water, and being bitten by flies that are waiting in the muddy riverbanks, uh, waiting for lunch to come to them. That's the story of West African disease. The East African disease is quite different. Uh, the East African variety really is an infection of bushbuck and waterbuck and antelope. It really is essentially an, an enzootic disease, a disease that specializes in non-humans. But once in a while, we get in trouble when we go on a safari or if we're just in East Africa and we happen to get bitten accidentally by one of these tsetse flies who thinks you're a water bug. He smells your armpits, he goes for you, and boom, you happen to get infected accidentally. So in either case, if you get a blood transfusion from one of these folks, you can have so-called mechanical transfer. This is described, but very rare. And just again to emphasize, Yep, there's also something called Nagana, which is T. brucei brucei, an infection of cattle, which causes wasting disease, and these cows rot on the bone, and the people who own them can't sell them for meat, and so it has economic uh, implications as well. So in East Africa, we're talking about a very small minority of cases, maybe 5% of all sleeping sickness happens with T. brucei uh, rhodesiense, or East African disease. And, you know, when Americans or Euros think about going to Africa, they think about going on safari and seeing these amazing, beautiful landscapes and generally making fools of ourselves, right, when we're on safari and taking our pictures. Now, these people are definitely <laughs> exposed to the tsetse fly, but this is such a small portion of what's actually happening. Human disease with East African uh, sickness really are the people who live and work in these areas, of course. This is very rarely a travel medicine-associated problem. This is a so-called tropical problem, much more so. So if you're keeping game, herding goats, cattle, etc., you need to get out there to make sure that no one comes and poaches the animals. You need to actually be a shepherd or a good herdsman. You have to be with those animals. And you can see how uh, these herdsmen or their children, who have no other choice but to do this work, might be exposed to this condition. Here's a picture of a, a zebu cow that's been um, wasted away. You can see the ribs coming through. It's not starving. There's plenty of green grass. It's just not eating properly. It's lost its appetite. It has sleeping sickness of cattle. East African disease, the minority. By far, the majority is West African sickness. I want you to think about this scene, mom and baby on her back. And in the rotting vegetation along the water, that's where the flies live and breed. And they, are, they don't ever have to leave because we come to them every 12 hours to try to pick up more water. Okay. So how does this condition present clinically? Because I showed you that poor case this unbelievable situation, families tying people to trees, what's going on? For both East and West, the disease starts the same way, and that is the so-called chancre. Okay, this is uh, an inflammatory response, the host immune system coming to the site of the bite, fighting off the antigens and the germs that were inoculated right into that particular bite site, the chancre. So chancre is just French for lesion, right? So there's the chancre of syphilis you've probably heard about. There's other chancres that are out there. 
I'm not French, I thought it was Schenker, we're supposed to be the chakra. And so what you're supposed to see here, this is the malleolus of a patient, the ankle, and they've got a swollen, uh, indurated, uh, inflamed bite site. And that's the same for both east and west. However, beyond the first stage, things seem to be different between the two flavors of disease clinically. In the case of West African disease, we see mostly this is second phase disease. Here's a girl um, from Liberia, and she has fever and a sore neck, and on examination, posterior chain of cervical lymphadenopathy. In fact, let's zoom in on this. So, look, we're in Denver talking about tropical medicine. I think I'm not a pediatrician. If I were a pediatrician, what would I be thinking about? This could be so many things, right? Infectious mononucleosis, maybe. I think of that more anterior chain than posterior. She could have lymphoma, I suppose. There's other stuff that goes to the posterior chains. But the bottom line is that if you are in the right epidemiologic setting, in a place that has an issue with fly control, you have to think about sleeping sickness in this occasion. Because if you do, you can save this kid's life. What's this called, this finding? Has anyone come across this? So this is Dr. Winterbottom figured this out. So it's called Winterbottom's sign, posterior unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, it sounds like an STD, doesn't it? Winterbottom. That was Dr. Winterbottom. <laughs> and although he has a reputation for being an evil slave trading guy, actually it's quite different. He came along much later, was not involved in the slave trade, uh, and helped to figure out what was going on. So his name goes with this sign. We're told, so I was told in the London course, that people who live in West Africa knew about this for a long time. And in fact, during uh, the invasion of Europeans to do the slave trade, they figured this out. And the observation was that if you were captured and you had winter bottom sign, you wouldn't survive middle passage. So the parents of young kids use this to their advantage. They would inoculate, so we're told, wound and inoculate the back of their kids with uh, some dirt or soil to cause a local inflammatory reaction to fool the slave traders. I don't know if it's true, but I just learned that story. Okay, so that's second phase West African disease. What about second phase of East African disease? It's totally different. It's not just cervical lymphadenopathy, it's sepsis. It's protracted high-grade fevers. It's patients who are profoundly altered, too sick to get out of bed. These are patients with multi-organ system failure, sepsis, and death. They usually don't even survive to the classical third stage. Third stage in West African disease is what I showed you before. These are patients who have an encephalitis. The encephalitis leads by definition, it's inflammation of the brain. It leads to cognitive difficulties. For reasons no one understands, a very classical day-night reversal that's there. And ultimately, without treatment, <coughs> these patients die. Human African trypanosomiasis, universally fatal, without treatment. The timing going from the bite to progression in West African disease and death may be months, even years. Colleagues of mine in London took care of a gentleman who was 30, I'm not making this up, 30 years after his exposure. That's distinctly rare and not a good teaching case, but the point is there's individual differences that are there. So let's summarize again. Here's a table of the, the different phases from East and West. So on the left is West African, on the right, East African disease. So they start off exactly the same. You have that Schenker inflammatory response at the bite site. And then the second phase is quite different. West African disease, you have lymphadenopathy. The lymph nodes are basically, as I think about them, sucking up these parasites. They're dealing with them. They're trying to wall them off. They're trying to learn how to fight off this single-celled microorganism. And they usually do OK for quite some time. There is an immune detente that is reached. My friend Matt Golden says, you know, when a host meets a bug, one of three things happen. Either you kill it, it kills you, or you reach an agreement. And in this case, they sort of reach an agreement, but ultimately, the bad guys win. In East African disease, it's different. The bone marrow, the liver, the spleen, they're all full of parasites, high fevers, coma, and death. And then, of course, in the classical third phase, what we talked about. There really is no third phase, usually, in East African disease. But in the West, it's that so-called sleeping sickness due to chronic encephalitis. Now, why does this happen? What's going on? Why can't we defeat these bugs? There probably are cases in which people have survived. We simply have never documented them because the surface of these germs, remember they're single cell, and they have uh, a protein coat, an antigen coat on their surface. That antigen coat um, is the same for virtually all of the population within the patient. You're bitten by a fly, probably just one or two bugs got into you, and they've divided like crazy. They're all clones of each other. 
And so just as your cellular and humoral immune system learns how to deal with that clone and wipes it out, there's a few mutants that have survived, and then they start to proliferate. And then another clone and another. So these, this is just a transmission electron microscope image to show you, is that protein <coughs> surface, which is very monomorphic, but unfortunately comes clone after clone. So you can imagine what happens to these patients. Eventually, not an immunologist, the way I think of it is their, their humoral immune system just gives up the dose. They cannot deal with it any longer. The B cells are shot because they have dealt for so long, for so many months, fighting off wave after wave of invaders. So what's happening, I think, is that you'll be seeing a patient, if you're working in country, who has fever. They may or may not recall the chancre. They may or may not know that they were bitten by the CTC, although, as you pointed out, they really do hurt. But a lot of these folks are bitten all the time. They'll say, I've been bitten by mosquitoes, flies, gnats, you, you name it. So how are you, as a clinician, going to figure this out? It's tough, because the differential diagnosis is so broad. And this really, I think, falls under that awful category of fever of unknown origin. It has to do with wearing your public health hat, what's happening with epidemiology of sleeping sickness in this community. What season is it? How bad are the flies? Going to the village elders, talking with experienced healthcare providers, what are you seeing in your community? On an individual basis, without that information, you're stuck with everything else that's as broad as the broad ocean can be. And if you're working on site, you may not have the diagnostic capacity to help tell these things. But these are the things that sort of come to mind for me as on my differential diagnosis, if you will. The key is that in order to make a diagnosis, you really need to look for this particular pathogen. So I love starting with a blood film. I was looking at the syllabus for the course. We have a module on malaria, correct? I think it's in a couple of days from now. So some of you in the room may not know how to make a blood film. You will. Everyone leaves this course, I'm sure, on how to make a blood film. It's so cheap. It's so easy. And it gives you so much information for malaria, but also for this particular infection as well, right? So this is just a right Gems uh, uh, film. Basically take a diabetes lancet or a little needle prick the side of the kid's finger, put a drop on the blood. We have just one piece of glass. It doesn't even have to be clean glass. You can use a broken window. I don't care. Put down a drop of blood on one side and then smear it out on the other. One side is fixed, one side is lysed, and then fixed. And then you look at it after staining with Gimsa. Very cheap. If you have access to a microscope, you can actually make this particular diagnosis because <coughs> you don't even have to be an MD to realize the round things are red cells and those other guys do not belong. When you've seen this, you've made your diagnosis, and you can then proceed the next way ahead. So you could also do this uh, if you had a lymph node. You could actually aspirate lymph juice out of that lymph node and blow that out onto a slide. Pathologists at my hospital hate that. They want the architecture of the node. I can't tell you if it's lymphoma unless you give me the whole node. The truth is, if you're doing what you have to do or you don't have a pathologist, just stick a needle into the blood, do a blood film. If that doesn't work, go right after the lymph node as well if it's secondary disease. We have ways and tricks here in the States where we try to get these things to light up like a Christmas tree. This is called an acridine orange stain. We use this stain to try to get these things to be easier to look at under the microscope. But the bottom line is, if you're looking for the bug itself. Now, it sounds easy, and it is cheap and easy, but there are just such a huge shortage of microscopes in country that MSF has created a separate detection technique, and it's very, very snappy. It's called the card agglutination test for trypanosomiasis, and instead of looking for the germ itself, you're simply uh, looking for an immunological response with respect to patients who are, uh, who are infected. And basically, you take a little bit of blood, put it onto a piece of paper, like wax paper, and then use a latex-coated agglutination bead to see if it'll react to the antigens that are in the blood. So from the back of the room, even with an LCD projector with the windows open, how do you read this test? Who's positive? No formal training, not CLIA approved, you're done. So this is such a brilliant thing. I love this test. The reagents are very cheap. They're available essentially exclusively through MSF and buy them through the WHO. Now you have to make this diagnosis because I want to emphasize, once you know who has infection with HAT, you need to understand how far the infection has gone. Because the treatments that we have to bear today on this infection are still so poor and so potentially toxic, we have to understand whether there's already invasion of the CNS or not. Does your patient have sleeping sickness before or after 
CNS invasion has happened. That's key. And still, I'm sorry to tell you, still today, the only way to do this is to perform a lumbar puncture. You need that CSF. And by the way, for God's sakes, wear gloves if you can possibly do so. I'd hate for you to jab yourself and end up catching an infection this way. And now he's got gloves on. So, so anyway, take a little bit of that CSF and take a look. Now, in theory, you should be able to see the actual microbes themselves in the CSF. And you'll see these pictures in the textbooks. The reality is, if you saw this on a direct statement of the CSF, your patient, I think, would be at death's door. What you're really doing with respect to the lumbar puncture is just looking for white cells. Is there an inflammatory response or not? And people debate back and forth, what should that white count be? What's an abnormal CSF white count? Where do we divide the line on the receiver operator curve? Is it 25 cells? Is it 12 cells? Is it 50 cells? Well, I was trained in London, as I said, 25 is the cutoff that they use. And I don't know. If I were in this situation, I don't know how I would respond to a white count of 23. That's not quite 25, but holy cow, two more cells and you would or would not treat these patients very, very differently. So it's a problem. I will say that because it shows up on exams, if not in the microscope, this is a morula cell of Mott. So the morula cell, I think, is a mulberry cell. It kind of looks to me like a blackberry. This is a B cell. These are B cells gone wild. This is a B cell that has given up the ghost. It's made so many different antigens over, the antibodies to fight the antigens over time. Occasionally, you may actually see this on a direct stain of the CSF, although I certainly never have. So let me summarize again to explain where we are. You're going to make a diagnosis because you are a medical professional and you're going to do a history and a physical. There's no other magic way to make this diagnosis. You have to think hat. And when you do so, you'll then confirm your diagnosis, blood smear, or lymph node aspirin. Uh, and if you can't do that, try the CARD agglutination test for trypanosomiasis or CAT. Now, these will either be positive or negative. If they are positive, you'll do a lumbar puncture. You want to know how many white cells are in there. Is it inflammatory or not? Because if it's not, you can treat these patients pretty well with suramin or pentamine. These are nasty, but they won't kill your patient, right? If they're positive, you need to use this other much more toxic regimen that I'll talk to you about. And I'll just emphasize, if all that workup is negative, these patients may still have encephalitis. There's plenty of case reports of people who had a negative LP and went on to die of sleeping sickness. So you need to keep an open mind to this. But I think the same is true here. If all of that workup is negative and you go up I don't know, you're hunting down HIV or mononucleosis, keep an open mind here too. None of these tests, the blood film or the CAT, they don't have a perfect negative predictive value. Always be willing to revisit your differential diagnosis. It's good general medical advice, but certainly when you have limited diagnostic acumen. So why do we deal with this? What's the big deal about CSF disease anyway? So if, if you don't have central nervous system involvement, you can use this particular drug called pentamidine in West African disease. And in fact, uh, many of us have used pentamidine. I use it for my patients on an inhalational basis as a pneumocystis prophylaxis, right? If patients really can't take sulfa, they really can't take sulfa. It's so rare, but I do have a few people who really can't take sulfa, and I end up using this drug. So you've seen it used before. What you may not realize is that um, when you actually give it intramuscularly, it can cause muscle necrosis, it can cause pain, it's sort of a hassle to give, and it requires coming back to get an injection every other day for 10 doses. That's basically 20 days of treatment. That means the patient needs to live near the clinic. There are a lot of logistical barriers to using this. An alternative for East African disease, really what we rely on, is this drug called Suramin. And the problem with Suramin is that it is also a potentially toxic drug. The treatment is difficult to give. It's usually given intravenous, not intramuscular, and that means that you need an IV angiocap to put into these patients day after day. That is not easy to come by in many of these areas. I would also say that a lot of these patients will herx out. So what, is, what do I mean by herx? Who were Yarish and Herx? I actually don't know. There are probably a couple of med students who sweat blood back in the 1920s or something. What is the Yarish Herxheimer reaction? Anybody seen anybody Herx? None of you have done this to patients? So Yarish and Herxheimer figured out that if you have a heavy infectious load in your patient, for example, rickettsial infection, uh, you have rickettsia prowazeki, and you give a little penicillin, every one of those germs will die at the same time, because they're incredibly susceptible to antibiotics. This is great for killing the germ, but it's awful for the patient, because you're just instantly shown this huge antigenic load these patients get. Well, they go into sepsis, they see all this LPS, they have vasodilation, they go into shock. So that's what we call the Yarish-Herxheim reaction. Give a dose of antibiotic and make your patient sicker.
sort of against what we're trying to do. And that happens in a number of reported cases with respect to uh, certain as well. In particular, if there's a drug an infection called onchocerciasis on board. I'm going to talk to you about onchocerciasis after lunch, so don't worry about that yet. So that's all. That's painful. This is a problem. I hate this stuff. It's a real issue. But this is all good because this works, right? So the bad news has to do with CNS disease. So in CNS disease, we worry about this particular medicine called Malarsoprol. The trade name is Mel B in Europe. That's what it's called. So everybody see what I circled there in red? What is that? With your eagle, young eagle eyes, what is that chemical moiety I circled up there? Not commonly found in a lot of the biological molecules that you deal with on a daily basis. And this is arsenic, right? And um, isn't there a play, Arsenic and Old Lace, about how you kill people? And that stuff's poison. This is old school antimicrobial poison. So when we use arsenic in these patients, it can be a catastrophe. It does a great job getting across the blood-brain barrier. That's the good news. The bad news is it does a great job getting across the blood-brain barrier. So patients may die of what we call arsenical encephalopathy. Perhaps 10% of these patients will die of arsenic poisoning in their brain. So my teacher uh, in the London School is a lovely man called David Maybe. Uh, who's one of the senior folks at the London School, but he took care of a patient who had this condition. He insisted on going to the ward himself and infusing the Mel B on his own. He wouldn't let the nurse do it because he knew he was likely to kill the patient and he didn't want the nurse to feel guilty about having done this. How lame is that in 2013 that we're still using drugs like this? It's just inexcusable. Here's a doc from MSF. It's a very heartrending quote. It's a terrible drug. You don't feel proud injecting it. It's caustic, it burns them. You don't even know if you're going to save your patient or kill them. We clearly need new and better medications. There is hope along these lines. So this is a medicine called Ornidol, or Eflornithine. Eflornithine is a fascinating medicine. It's actually this chemical, DFMO. So it's ornithine with two fluoromethyls, DFMO. Difluoromethyl ornithine has a very ignominious history. It's a drug that works well in non-CNS West African disease. It doesn't work for East African disease, and it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as well as it should. This is a chemical that was developed in the, uh, what's the word, uh, for the cosmetic industry. So if you take some of this and you spread it on your uh, lip, then your mustache goes away. So it was one of these, gee, my lip looks hairless products. And long after MSF could no longer get it to give to their patients, it was, I think it was Novartis who was selling it, uh, anyway, whoever it was, selling it at a very high rate in Europe for these much less important indications. They reached an agreement. There is now a tenuous supply of this medication, which is available to, I think it was maybe Aventus. Let's see. Yeah, so WHO and Aventus are working on this. It's still 300 US dollars per dose. And I think you're very clear right, that in most of the places where patients are infected, that's far exceeds the annual healthcare expenditure per capita in these areas. We clearly need new and better medications. This drug called Nifertimox is one of them. It's useful in other trypanosomal infections we'll talk about in just a moment. It makes people sick. And in fact, we think that if we combine Nifertimox with aflornithine, we actually have better outcomes than using either one of them alone. A lot of nausea, a lot of GI intolerance. It takes uh, some time to get the doses into patients. But this is what MSF is doing. And they have just recently, uh, several months ago, published a very nice series looking at more than uh, 150 patients who were treated this way. The great majority actually survived, even some who had gone on to so-called classical third stage disease. So this is sort of the state of the art. Expensive, difficult to use, not a lockbox, but probably the best we've got. If we do this, we even repeat those CSF analyses periodically, month by month, to make sure that the infection is well and truly gone. So if it's not, we have to restart that cycle all over again. So this sucks. The question is, how do we prevent this? And of course, as you'll hear about with respect to malaria, it's all about that vector, right? Vector <laughs> prevention, this is the state of the art. So what is that thing on the picture behind me? Flytrap. It's a flytrap. It's a piece of cloth, black and blue cloth, and I don't know why tsetse flies go crazy for black and blue. They're <laughs> angry or they're horny or something. When they see black and blue, they go like crazy to it. So if you spray that cloth with an insecticide like permethrin, they die. And so this is a terrific technology. And 
If you do it peri-domestically, when people go to the water, around people's homes, in endemic areas, you can have a great protective effect for these communities. It's very low tech. The chemicals are essentially non-toxic. They can be retreated. Uh, this is sort of the antithesis of PCR and all the molecular stuff we do. This sewing machine looks like it's from the 1800s. It's fine. It totally works. Here's an example of a sack of potatoes that happened to be the right color. Somebody cut it in half, staked it out, sprayed it, and now that's a fly trap, and it works. So I love this technology because it's very, very useful. My career, before I made my switch, was doing this, trying to figure out the intermediary metabolism of these bugs, figuring out where the, the key uh, choke points are in metabolism, how can we block these choke points using small molecules. It was exciting, and we would do all kinds of DNA analysis, trying to figure out the differences between our native sequences and the sequences of these same molecules and these bugs. And I have tremendous respect for everybody who currently does that, including Wes Van Boris and Fred Bucker in uh, our labs at the U. The reality is that this still happens. We are still very far away from these new medications. And the last slide is, uh, this is a young man who actually was diagnosed towards the later stages of disease and was saved, but he had already sustained brain damage from his encephalitis. So he, he can't catch up with his education. He won't become a productive income earner for his family. There is no Department of Social Welfare for these communities. The burden, even for these cases that are survived, is so totally tremendous and awful. So I'll answer your question. I would say that after each of these lectures, I'm going to give you these key concept slides because we're going through a lot. Remember, there's two flavors of hat. You can make a diagnosis looking in the lymph juice or in the blood or using this cardioglutination test for trypanosomiasis. You need to know if it's in the brain. If it's in the brain, you've got to treat with a very toxic, challenging medication regimen. Uh, we prevent this by fly control. We, de you know, we desperately need new medications and vaccines. Is there any utility to avoiding wearing blue and black clothing? Yeah, what about what about what we actually wear? The uh, and should we avoid those clothing? Absolutely. Ask any med doctor. If they go on safari, they won't wear blue or black. And they won't